Welcome back to the Word of God ministry coming to you from St. John's Lutheran Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I am Pastor Tom Clocker. And as always, I'm just thrilled when you join us um, uh, for this ministry of God's Word because I know that God promises to bless us through His Word, uh, that His Holy Spirit is present working whenever we hear God's Word. The Spirit is there working in our heart. And so, I'm glad that you're with us, and I thank God for what, already for what he's going to do among us as we consider um, his word today. Last week, we uh, looked at the story of David and King Saul when Saul was trying to chase David down and kill him, and David hid in the cave. We're going to look at that story again today, but from a little bit of a, of a different angle. But let's take a moment to uh, ask the Lord to come and to bless us and to be with us this day. We um, gather... We worship, we focus upon the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first lesson, there are multiple stories of caves in the Old Testament, especially because that was basically what people used to, uh, to hide from enemies, to store uh, their wealth and, and hide that and so forth. So this one comes from us to us from Joshua. Chapter 10, verses 16 to 27. If you want to pause and look that up again, that's Joshua 10, verses 16 to 27. Now these five kings had fled, and they had hidden themselves in a cave at Machidah. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings have been found hidden in the cave of Machidah. So Joshua said, roll large stones up against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemies and attack their rear guard. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. Then it happened while Joshua and the children of Israel made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter till they had finished that those who escaped entered the fortified cities. And all the people returned to the camp, to Joshua at Magidah in peace. No one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then Joshua said, Open now the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me from the cave. And they did so, and they brought out those five kings to him from the cave. And the king of Jerusalem the king of Hebron, the king of Jormuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon. So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all men of Israel and said to the captains of the men who were at war with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on the king's necks. Then Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterwards Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees until evening. So it was at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and cast them into the cave where they had been hidden and laid large stones against the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, where Paul recognizes our sufferings, but says that one of the blessings that comes from out of our sufferings is an ability to console others who suffer as we have. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel today is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, 16th chapter, beginning in the 19th verse. Reading through verse 31. Luke 16, 19 through verse 31. Now there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and in fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But then there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in the torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all that, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, Well, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, All right, well, today Pastor is going to be talking about David. Remember David? He killed Goliath. Goliath was this big guy about 10 feet tall. He had a sling and a rock and he killed him, right? But the king wasn't David. The king was a guy named Saul. And Saul was after David. Because you know why? Because he was jealous. Because David had done this great victory and had victory over the Philistines. and, and, And Saul got jealous over that. So Saul was out to get David. So David ran and he had about 400 guys with him. And he ran and hid in a cave. Okay? So have any of you been in a cave before? You've been in a cave? It's pretty dark in there, right? And yeah, you guys have too, right? 
Okay, so I got some statistics here, okay? In North Carolina, there are over 900 caves and caverns, several open to the public. So I guess the probably the ones we know are the ones that we go to and, you know, visit, okay? So here are some of the big uh, caverns in North Carolina. All right, the Linville Caverns. Probably most of us are familiar with that. Uh, they, they say that uh, those caverns stay at about 52 degrees all year long. Now, do you know what 52 degrees is? Would you have to have a coat on if it was 52 degrees? Yeah, it's like winter. Yeah, it's like winter. Well, it's pretty cold, and you'd have to have probably long pants and a coat on to be in that cave for very long. Okay? Well, think about David. Now, he had 400 guys, and they went inside a cave, and they were way in the back of the cave, right? All right, how about the Boone Cave? It's in Lexington. Well, Lexington's only about 30 miles south of here, so if you get a chance to go down there, you can check that one out. There's one in Walnut Cove called Torrey's Den. Okay, that's up by Hanging Rock State Park. They say that one's so dark, it's one of the darkest ones around, that you have to be, uh, you would be wise to take a flashlight with you when you go in there. <laughs> Okay, because, you know, if you go inside of a cave and way in the back, you don't know what's in there, right? I mean, there could be some animal back there, or spiders, and you know, stuff caveman. like that. Maybe a caveman. caveman. Might be a caveman. Okay, there's a couple more. There's one in uh, Chimney Rock, in uh, Lake Lure. That's called the Rumbling Bald Cave. And then in Asheville, there's something called the Salt Cave. So I just thought you might be interested in that. Now what I have with me today, you know, if you go inside that cave, like David was in the cave, he had 400 men. Now do you think 400 men could, could uh, fit right in here? That'd be a lot, wouldn't it? I mean, maybe you get 100 people in here. Well, he had 400 of them, okay, that he had to keep quiet because he knew that Saul was after him. He probably had somebody outside, you know, watching, and they could probably see Saul coming. And so they all went and hid way in the back of the cave. Well, when Saul came in there, he looked around, didn't see anybody, didn't hear anybody. And you know what? You have to be, have pretty good patience with 400 men to not be heard by somebody that comes in the front door, right? So he did, he was very quiet and Saul was in there and David crept up and cut off part of Saul's robe right down here at the bottom someplace, just cut off the corner of it. Cut the corner right off. Saul didn't even know he was there, though. That's how quiet he was. And then Saul went out, and after he went out, David went out and said, Hey, Saul, you're, you're after me, aren't you? you? You're trying to kill me. And David humbled himself before God and got on the ground and was very humble before him. And Saul realized it because David said, Look, I could have harmed you because, look, it, I got a piece of your rope right here. But I didn't harm you because you are, you know, I don't want to do that to you. And uh, so Saul felt kind of bad about that. So he thought, well, you know what? You're a better man than I am because, you know what? I was going to harm you and you had mercy on me and I was going to harm you. So, you know what? You're a better guy than I am. But you know what? I brought something here and God protected him. That's the whole idea. You know, God, God you know, David could have harmed him, but he didn't. So. God was, uh, David was listening to God because God had told him, well, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And his men were trying to get him. We don't go ahead, get Saul, you know, this is your chance. But he didn't. He said, well, I'm listening to God and I think God wouldn't like that if I killed his anointed, you know, his king. So I got something here. You know what this is? Yeah. This is a, a welder's mask. And you know what? If you put this on, are you going to be able to see anything, you think? Yeah. It's very dark in here. And it's dark because that's supposed to protect the welder's eyes from light, okay? Well, if you put this on in the daytime when you don't even have any bright light, I mean, it is dark in here. Does anybody want to try this on? You want to try it on? You want to? Okay, I'll stand up. All right. Put this on and look at the back door there and tell me if you can see anything. Is it dark? I can't see anything. Can't see anything, okay? All right. Bless, you want to look at it? Okay, you look up there and you look back there. Can you see any light? All I see is all I see is darkness, she said. Do you want to try it? Okay, back up. That's what it would be like being in that cave. Don't you think that would be really, really scary? Yeah. Kind of being in a dark, dark cave like that. And you look in there, can you see any light? No, no light whatsoever. Well, even though we can't see God, 
we can know and rest assured that God is with us, right? Because he's with us no matter where we go. All right, so Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not be afraid, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So he encourages us that God is with us no matter what, no matter what our circumstances are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks for being with us. No matter where we are, in the back of a cave, or in the light someplace, or at the store, no matter where we are, you're with us, and you're our shield, and from last week, our rock, and you will protect us. Thank you for that encouragement. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Okay, guys, I got a little snack here for you. You can have one of these. They're all the same. Hymn 738. Hymn 738. Our sermon text is 1 Samuel 22, 1 to 2, and 1 Samuel 24, 1 to 20, which was our sermon text the last time we were together. David therefore departed and escaped to the cave of Adalam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard about it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to David. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told to him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. So then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went into the cave to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. But then David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him, because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David restrained his servants with these words, did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And so Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also rose afterward and went out of the cave and called out to Saul saying, my Lord, my king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stopped, excuse me, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed David seeks you harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, this is the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. So let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not rise against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog, a flea? Therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And then he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, where I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me, for when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. 
For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Thus our sermon text for consideration today. Let us turn our hearts to the Lord and ask that he would bless our time together. Father, we do pray that you bless our time in the word that um, your Holy Spirit would use your word to speak to us today, especially of the, the comfort and blessing that you bring when we are in our own cave of darkness. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross where he died to pay the payment for the sins of all of us. And he rose victorious on Easter morning to conquer death and go to prepare a place for each of us who believe and trust in him. Lord, bless the name of your son Christ, and may he be worshipped forever. Amen. So David is in the cave hiding for his life from King Saul. And if you want to hear a little more background about that, you can listen to last week's sermon. I talk about the different caves, describe the area, and so forth. But what we got last week was we learned some lessons from the cave on how David responded in the time that he was in the cave and um, his life was being threatened by Saul. The first lesson was we shouldn't judge people based on what others tell you. Saul was basing his anger and hatred towards David based on what other people were telling Saul that David was planning or plotting or or so forth. Um, And so he judged David based on what he heard from other people. We should be very, very cautious about that. The second thing is we need to be very cautious when we look at a circumstance and claim that we know it is of God or you know what God is doing for sure in this circumstance. David's men thought for sure that God had delivered Saul into David's hand, but God was doing something completely different in these circumstances. The third lesson was how do Christians trust those in authority? We respect, obey, and pray for them. Number four, we were reminded that vengeance belongs to God, not us. And number five, we were reminded to be humble in our dealings with others, even with our enemies. We're going to take a different tact this week, and we're going to look at blessings that come to us in the cave. Now, the blessings are for believers in Christ. If you have not yet trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be a day of salvation, that you would pray that the Holy Spirit would come and convert you to true faith in Jesus, that you might have the blessings we talk about today, and that you may have the blessings that will last forever in heaven. Let us pray. Father, if there are any in the hearing of my voice who have not yet trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be a day of salvation, that you would plant seeds of faith within their hearts that would grow up into true trust and faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so that they might receive the blessings that he gave us through the cross, the forgiveness of sins, and our life in heaven forever. Amen. Well, when we think about a cave, we often think of a place that's dark and lonely. There's no way out. It's damp and chilled, and we don't know which way to turn. And that's where David was at this time. You know, a few times in history were darker than during the Nazi occupation and the persecution of the Jews. During that period, in a little Dutch house, Corrie Ten Boom and her family hid. They hid afraid for their lives. They hid surrounded by enemies who wanted them dead. They hid often in long periods of darkness and silence. They hid with no way out and nowhere to turn. It was for them a time to live in a cave. It was there hiding place. Often when the scripture talks about caves, it tells stories about 
people hiding from their enemies. Of course, David in our story today, but in Obadiah one time, Obadiah hid 100 prophets of God into two different caves because the people were uh, uh, plotting to kill um, God's prophets. <clears throat> and then in our story today, we saw how the five kings um, were hiding from uh, Joshua. The dark, lost, and loneliness of the cave can seem foreboding and frightening. However, God comes to us when we're in the cave. And God makes it a place where we can hide in him. It becomes for us a place of refuge and shelter. And the darkness may still be there, and the danger may still surround us, but God ministers to us in the cave when life is dark. If we study David's cave experiences, we can see blessings that come when we are in the cave. And the first blessing I want to talk about is fellowship. When a believer finds himself in life's cave, God blesses that cave with fellowship. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, fellowship with God. You will never be closer to God than when you're in the darkness of life's cave. When you can't see where you're going, when you can't see your way out, when you don't know where to turn, that's what David did. He turned to God and he wrote, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will make refuge until these calamities pass me by. When life is good, when it's sunshine and beauty all around, we usually are not as focused or tuned in on God as when we are in the cave. When we are in the cave, the first thing we want to do is hide under God's wings until the calamities pass us by. Not like an ostrich. We don't bury our head in the sand. There's no blessing or comfort in that. But we hide in God. We take refuge in him. So what was David's reaction to this intimate fellowship with God? David wrote, my heart has become steadfast and I will sing and praise him, even in the cave. Our trust in God, our faith grows in the cave. Someone said, you'll never know Jesus is all you need until the day when Jesus is all you've got. When you're in the darkness and despair of one of life's caves, only God can bring true strength to your heart. Only God can restore a song upon our lips. But there's a second form of fellowship that God blesses us with when we're in the cave. Our sermon text said, when David was afraid for his life and alone in the darkness and despair of the cave, that David's brothers and his household went to him, his family. But not just his family. It also says others were coming who were in distress and over 400 gathered with him. God sent others to fellowship and be with David during his time in the cave, to minister to David in the cave. And when you are in the cave, God will bring people beside you to minister to you, to help you and to lift you up, to stay beside you until you find a way out. Oh, what a blessing is the fellowship of other believers when we find ourselves in the cave. Brothers and sisters, when you are in the cave, look for the blessing of a greater fellowship with God, a greater trust and dependence upon him, and rejoice in the people that God sends to stand with you. The second blessing God brings us when we're in the cave is the blessing of prayer. God turns the silence of our cave into the cries of our hearts. Nothing so deepens your prayer life than when you're in life's cave. No matter how deep your cave, no matter how down you've fallen, no matter, God still hears and answers 
our prayers. God heard and answered Jonah from the deep in the belly of a whale. There is a cave, there is no cave of despair, no situation so far gone that God cannot hear our prayers turned in his direction. As a matter of fact, I think the caves hear the best prayers. God's people shine brightest when life seems darkest. You'll never have prayed so well, so honestly, so sincerely, and so directly to God as when the darkness of the cave surrounds you. Many have prayed to God in the cave who never thought to pray to God in the sunshine. And notice it was not just crying out, not just sobbing. Over and over, David said, I cry out to the Lord. I cry out to God most high. So when we pray, we're taking our situation and our darkness and our cave and we're taking it to the one who loves us and is powerful enough to answer our prayers. Friends, if your car breaks down, don't call me. I may love you, but I'm not going to be much help to you. For believers, when we're in the cave, prayer is that special gift where we can call 911 to a powerful God who desires to hear and answer our prayers. And he answers according to his love for us in Jesus. First, God turns our caves into a time of deeper fellowship with him and with other believers. Second, we turn it all over to him in prayer, and he hears and answers our prayers and does his good will. The last blessing we're going to mention is the one that we often miss. God turns our time in the cave into the blessing of ministry. Let me repeat that. God turns our time when we're in the cave into the blessing of ministry. Not other people ministering to us. That's covered under the fellowship point we made earlier. But God gives us ministry opportunities when we're in the cave to bless others. What do I mean by that? As Christians, we all want to serve Jesus. And we all want lives to give glory to God. And often that ministry happens not when the rose is blooming, but when our vine feels withered. Remember the 400 who came to David. David could have been so consumed with his own problems that he blew off the 400. Instead, David ministered to them and leads them. The passage says these 400 were distressed and outcast. Despite David's own real trial, God provides David an opportunity in it to minister to others. Many of them going through exactly what David is going through. When you are in a cave, when you've been through a cave, God will bring to you people that you can minister God's love to precisely because you know what being in that cave is like. In the blessing of our cancer ministry here at St. John's, one of the things that I observed and, and learned is that the best people to minister to those who are facing or battling cancer is those who have already faced and battled cancer. They've been through that experience. God has helped them in it and they're able to share those words of encouragement and support to others who now face the same thing that they did. <clears throat> Gwen, um, early on, became acquainted with the cave of grief. Her mom died very quickly, very shockingly. And since then, God has used her to minister to many others when they are in a time of grief, when they're going through the same cave. Our second lesson from 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God, the Father of mercies, the God of comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort which we ourselves 
have been comforted by God. So God comforted us in our troubles, and then he gives us the opportunity to comfort others who are going through the same troubles as we have. Brothers and sisters, nobody likes to be in the cave. However, for those of us who are in Christ, we are guaranteed that one day we will be rescued. One day we will see the light at the end of the tunnel. One day we'll step out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Because for those of us who are in Jesus, we dwell in a cave of mercy and grace. At the end of the story, Saul comes into the cave. Saul deserves to die. He has been unfairly and unjustly trying to kill David. David has every right by justice to put Saul to death. But David only cuts off a piece of Saul's robe and he lets Saul live. David turns what should have been a cave of death for Saul into a cave of forgiveness and new life. The reason you and I will always, always have victory over our caves is because Jesus did that very same thing for us. The cave that you and I dwell in throughout our lives, the greatest darkness that surrounds us, the lost paths that lead us nowhere, are our many sins. We are cavemen and cave women. And what we paint on the walls of our cave are pictures and stories of our life. And they tell the tale of sin and selfishness and a story of all the times we put ourselves first over God and over others. There are paintings of the hurts we caused others. There are drawings of lies and stories of our mistreating and tales of our lust and greed and our pride and our anger and our gossiping. Then there's a list of all the times we've complained against God and the painful arrows that we've shot out of our mouth towards others. Brothers and sisters, we are cave dwellers and the pictures that we paint through life and the stories that we leave behind tell the tales of our sin. And so when death comes, we enter that tomb of a cave just like Saul. We deserve to die, to be buried in and with our sins. But Jesus turns our caves of sin and death into forgiveness and new life. Jesus, not Laura Croft, is our tomb raider. He enters our cave and he lifts us to victory. Jesus gives us victory over every cave, victory over the trials and burdens of life, victory over our sin, victory over death, because Jesus is no cave dweller. They tried that. They tried to shut him up in a cave. They killed him and they threw him in a cave carved from rock and rolled a huge stone across the mouth of the cave. But praise God, the cave couldn't hold him. Thank the Lord that Jesus is no cave dweller, Jesus is a cave emptier. Jesus entered the cave to save you and me from death and give us eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Pray with me if you would. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us as we now all pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for being with us this week. We look forward to being with you again next weekend uh, as we continue to consider God's word of grace and blessing for you and me. I pray now that in the meantime, that the Lord would bless you and keep you that the Lord would make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, 
that the Lord would look upon you with favor and fill you with his peace. Amen.